Hello everyone, we're going to be going over EE330, the main concepts that we should have seen in class. And so we're going to begin a little bit. And so I'm going to just be going through all the lecture topics that you should have seen. And so um, here you can just follow along. So lecture one was based off analog electronics. And so what does that mean? What is analog electronics? Well, we had specific types of devices when we're talking about analog electronics, and those can either be vacuum tubes, or you can have gas tubes. And so uh, what do those uh, basically entail? So what you need to know about vacuum tubes is they're heated up enough to release electrons and they are known as thermionic devices thermionic because therm if you think about it it's heat so you have to heat it up for electrons to be released where gas tubes on the other hand they're thyrations and so basically you have to have really high voltages and currents for an antenna to release any electromagnetic radiation but that's just a little bit on devices, what two types of devices we talked about beforehand. But we're going to be focusing now more on what the class covers. And so the big part of 330 that was the most important is what's a semiconductor. So a semiconductor, it basically shares properties between a conductor um, and an insulator. So conductors, those are really good. That's like metal and stuff that can conduct very well. Like if a lightning strikes, is that electricity is going through it, so you don't want to touch it. But insulators, on the other hand, that's like wood. And like and So if an electric bolt hits it, then basically it's not going to conduct and you won't die. And so that's the big thing is where do semiconductors lie between the two? Semiconductors lie between conductors, which are really conductive, and insulators, which aren't conductive. So they have the in-between properties. So they're not a conductor, which is conductors are metals, but they're also not insulators. And insulators, uh, the main ones we'll see is like fiberglass, there's uh, wood, that's a common one, plastic. It's just any of those that do not conduct well. And so now that we went over semiconductors, they have those in-between properties, so they're between a conductor and insulator. We're gonna be talking a little bit about solids. So solids, they can either be macroscopic, and so, when you see macro, macro means very large, right? And so um, basically the material can uh, support a large force to it. But microscopic, on the other hand, micro is really tiny. If you remember like micrometer, it's times 10 to the negative six. Uh, oh, sorry, microscopic. And so it's a material with fixed atom positions. And so this one is super tiny, whereas the macroscopic, it is a large material. It can support a larger force on it, where microscopic, it is tiny because it's like in the atom range. It's like in the micro range. And so that's the main parts you guys uh, will see. But the main focus on this part was just that semiconductors were the in-betweens between conductors and insulators. That's the main thing to take away from this. And then... Now we're going to look at the periodic table a little bit. So the periodic table, if you remember from your chemistry class, how it's structured is it's grouped by basically group one materials, group two materials, group three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then um, nine and ten, like so on and so forth. So like B111, or if you can do IX, whatever, and then 10. And so um, it, it can go on and on and on, or sorry, <laughs> no. Um, we'll just be talking about uh, mainly one grouped one through uh, eight, what we're going to see. And so conductors, we're going to see, they're mostly just group one through three. 
That's where we'll most likely see them. We have our conductors here. And we have our insulators, which is group 6 through, and then we have it 8 here. And that's where we'll generally see them on our periodic table. And so a lot of times when we're dealing with the elemental semiconductors, and the big ones for elemental, elemental means one. It's usually geranium or silicon. And the reason those are the elemental semiconductors is because they have four electrons in their outer shell. So that's the important thing to take away. So if I were to draw these in their just uh, little structure, it looks something like this. And those represent the four electrons on the outside of it. Then we also have geranium, which has four electrons on the outside as well. And so that's what it looks like. So the semiconductor has four outer electrons, whereas compound semiconductors, on the other hand, what does a compound mean? It basically is more than one. And so compound semiconductors, which ones for those, it's usually, usually gallium arsenide. We'll see that a lot. And then uh, we can have gallium phosphide and... Um, the most important thing is just compound semiconductors come from group 3 and 5 materials, or you can also have group 2 and 6 materials. And so that's where you'll see compound semiconductors, and that's where they lie in our periodic table. So you guys know, is oftentimes uh, what you need to just Recall is our elemental semiconductors. These are the big two you're going to see, geranium and silicon. Those are the ones used. Silicon is used more often than geranium. Since silicon, it requires um, a larger temperature since it, since it has a larger band gap, and we'll get into that later. Uh, and then our compound semiconductors, ones you might see, the most popular is gallium arsenide, as I've seen in all the other EE courses so far. And so that's the little periodic table uh, review right there. And so let's focus a little bit on the band gap. I brought that up. And that's going to help determine which one is an insulator, which one is a semiconductor, and then which one is a conductor. And so let's look at the band gaps of all these. And so for insulator, I'm going to draw on the very left-hand side here. And then uh, we have our valence band, and we have a conduction band. And then for our semiconductor here, we have our valence band and our conduction band. And then for our actual conductor here on the very right, we have our valence band and our conduction band. Okay, so if I were to label all these, um, the upper one is the conduction band, the lower one is the valence band. Same thing here, conduction band, valence band, then conduction band, valence band. And so it looks like that. And so the one on the very left I told you guys was insulators. One in the middle was semiconductor. And the one on the very right was a conductor. And so the one on the very left for an insulator, it has a large band gap. And so the band gap is going to look here, if we draw it out, it's the gap between the valence band and the conduction band here. And we symbolize band gap with E of G. And then here we can notice in the semiconductor, it has a smaller band gap. And here in the conductor, the band gap, the two are overlapping, so there's really no band gap at all. And so the important thing to take away from this is just realizing that the amount of energy required for an electron in the valence band to go to the conduction band is much less in a conductor than in a semiconductor than in an insulator. So an insulator, it's the hardest for an electron here, 
in order to gain enough energy for it to jump here into the conduction band and occupy um, one of those states here. So that's the hardest for the jump. You have to have a lot of energy required because you have to make a larger jump. That makes sense. However, in the conductor, very little energy is required for an electron to go into the conduction band. And in a semiconductor, it has the properties between an insulator and conductor, so therefore it can jump if it is provided sufficient energy. And that is the main takeaway from here. Okay, two numbers you should be familiar with, though for band gaps, is what I like to know, is the band gap for silicon and the band gap for geranium. And I mentioned these a little earlier, uh, geranium has a band gap of 0.66 electron volts, where silicon has a band gap of 1.12 electron volts. And so therefore you can see in silicon, it is harder for it to jump, the electron to jump from here to here than it is in geranium, since geranium has a smaller band gap. However, we use silicon a lot more often than geranium, since geranium's fan gap was smaller, and so therefore when electrons could jump easierly, so it was harder due to the temperature, because um, when we have our temperature, it was easier for geranium to conduct, it almost acted like a conductor, so therefore we use silicon since we didn't want it conducting like near the room temperature as much, and we wanted to require a little more energy, and so it wouldn't be conducting all the time, so that's why you see silicon used a lot more than geranium, since um, it requires a little more energy, and um, it doesn't conduct easily at room temperatures. And now that we talked about what it looks like, our different band gap diagrams, we're going to look a little bit at the rate of generation and the rate of recombination. And those two he focused on primarily, so I want you guys just to be familiar with it, the terminology and how it, they work. So the rate of re, I'm sorry, generation, and what does generation mean? Generation, it basically means an electron hole pair is created. So that means you get an electron and you have a hole created. And so the rate of generation is a function of temperature and the band gap. And that makes sense because, let's flip back over, okay? when uh, we have our electron here in the valence band, right? And it's going to jump into the conduction band if sufficient energy is provided so that it's greater than the band gap energy required between the two. Well, if we have enough energy, that means that um, for our function going back here, basically, in order to create an electron hole pair, this electron has to jump from the valence band and when it makes that jump here to the conduction band, it leaves behind a hole. And so therefore, there's an electron now in the conduction band and a hole left behind in the valence band. So that's where the term electron-hole pair comes from, because an electron and hole are now existing. And so it's a function of in temperature, because with increase in temperature, it's going to cause it uh, to receive more energy in order to make that band gap jump. And so the rate of generation, it's also based off how large the band gap is. If you have a smaller band gap, it's easier for electron to jump to the conduction band, so there would be more generation. If the temperature is higher, therefore there would be more energy. And so if more energy is provided, it can make that jump across the band gap. Okay. The rate of recombination, so this is the working backwards, and so rate of recombination, what does that mean? The rate of recombination, it basically means we undo this process, so we combine the electron and the hole together, 
and then uh, that's going to just, they're going to combine with one another. So recombining. So have we created it here in generation? The recombination does the inverse process. And this is a function of the dopants. Um, and so um, your n-type dopants and your p-type dopants. And so it depends on how much you dope the material to determine how much it's going to recombine in order to reach that equilibrium again. Because it all, the system always wants to be at equilibrium. And in important um, terminology, I guess, to bring up is at equilibrium, the rate of generation is equal to the rate of recombination. And so that is an important just relationship to keep in the back of your mind is it wants to be at equilibrium. So that means like it's a fair balance between the two. So if we're creating these electron hole pairs, but they're recombining at the same rate, that's once we reach an equilibrium, since the two are equal, the two rates are equivalent to each other. So oftentimes when we refer to the equilibrium, when the system's at equilibrium, it means that the system, the rate of recombination is equal to the rate of generation of the electron hole pairs. And so now that we have covered that, and we'll want to look a little bit at the silicon, um, structure here. So we have our silicon atom. And remember how I told you guys, it has uh, basically four um, outside electrons. And so what it does is it shares one covalently with another silicon atom because another silicon atom has four outside electrons. And so it looks sort of like this, the covalent bonds between the two where they both share an electron. You're probably used to seeing it in chemistry class as something like this, where you have it on the outside. And then if we have another silicon atom here, we draw it out, they're going to share two between them. And then if we have one up here, they're going to share two as well. And then if we have one over here, they're going to share two on this side as well. And then if we have one below it, they're going to share two as well. And so you're probably used to seeing it this way in chemistry, but this shows the exact same um, relationship, is that when you have two silicon atoms next to each other, they're going to share covalently the electron. And so they can have eight electrons each. Because if you look at this center um, silicon, it has two above it, two here, two here, and two here. And remember how elements always want eight outside electrons in order to be happy. And so an important thing when we're looking at this diagram is when an electron, because we represent each of these bonds as one of the electrons shared between them, when an electron moves from its bonding location to an arbitrary, so arbitrary means like any location in the crystal, it causes hole flow. Because there's an empty valence band state. And so what I mean by that is when I said we had the electron here, there's an electron representing the one here, and then we have another uh, bond here representing the other electron. And so if an electron um, is moved from its bonding location, it's so we'll represent the electron here, it leaves behind a hole. And so that's what we're saying right here. When an electron moves from its bonding location, to an arbitrary location in the crystal, it causes hole flow because now there's an empty valence band state because there's a hole left behind. And so now we need to know the differences 
between uh, the crystal, the Pauli crystal, and the amorphous. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. Because a crystal, if you remember that, that's a fixed pattern of atoms. Pattern of atoms. And so it has like that lattice structure, which we like. Um, you guys have seen crystals before. Uh, basically, like they're all connected and it sort of looks something like, you know, the cubes, you're used to seeing them. It looks something like this. Okay, there we go. So like, it's something like, you know, the there's a fixed pattern, just like in this cube, like they're all connected and aligned, where the polycrystal, on the other hand, basically what that is, it's a region of fixed patterns. Region. Oops. Not uniform in solids. And the other one, which is amorphous, amorphous is the opposite of a crystal because there is no regular pattern at all. So there's no structure. Of that atomic arrangement that was already produced. And so uh, the main things uh, that you should know from here, basically, is when we have our semiconductors, they share properties of conductors and insulators because they're in-betweens. What we see is the elemental semiconductors are geranium and silicon, where the compound semiconductors usually will see group 3 and 5 or 2 and 6 materials. Gallium arsenide is the most popular. Here's the band gap diagrams for all three insulators, semiconductors, and conductors. Insulators have a large band gap. Semiconductors have, um, you know, like medium-sized band gap, and conductors have almost no band gap because they overlap with each other. And so the band gap energy required for geranium is 0.66 electron volts, where the band gap energy required for silicon is 1.12 electron volts. And this is the probably most important thing from the second part of it. The rate of generation of electron hole pairs is a function of temperature and the band gap energy, where the rate of recombination is a function of the dopants. And so at equilibrium, these two rates are equal to one another. And that's the most important thing I'd say to take away from it. And so he goes a little bit into the refining process of silicon how to produce it so um if you guys just want like a little sneak peek i'll just tell you guys it basically starts off silica is sand so at the beach you see sand you know and so that does a combination of other stuff in it so it's basically like impure at that point but we reduce it in the presence of carbon and at that point so we have impure silicon and we chlorinate it. So chlorinating, the best way I like to think about it is, you know how you have your pool in the backyard and how it could have a lot of algae in it? So you use chlorine in order to make it clean again. And so that will form silicon chloride. And so you have your silicon chloride, but you have to distill it in order to create ultra pure silicon chloride. And finally, you reduce it in the hydrogen atmosphere, so we only get ultra-pure silicon. So the biggest thing to just know is sil whenever you have silicon, it is produced from sand, which I think is pretty cool. So it's just coming from sand like you can have at the beach. And so at that point, it is um, pretty impure silicon. We know that. So we chlorinate it, just like the pool in our backyard. We want to make it clean. We don't want to jump in a pool full of gross liquid stuff. And so after we chlorinate it, it becomes silicon chloride. And so that makes sense. Silicon with chlorine, silicon chloride. And so now we get, um, after we chlorinate it, we get silicon chloride, and then we distill it in order to create that ultra pure silicon chloride. And then we finally reduce it in the hydrogen atmosphere. So we only get silicon from this.
And so we reduce it in a hydrogen atmosphere in order to create ultra pure polycrystalline silicon. And so that is the main parts of just lecture one to tell you guys to focus on. Okay. Now we're going to go over lecture two. And so lecture two focused a little bit on the silicon wafer production. And um, I thought that was pretty important just to touch a little bit on so we know how it works. I thought that one was easier to understand. So we'll begin lecture two. So how is silicon a silicon wafer actually produced? And a lot of times... Um, Silicon wafers, you see them, they sort of look like a CD, you know, because they're very reflective, but chips are made out of them. Silicon wafers, transistors, because silicon's used for anything that needs to, like, be a switch, um, because MOSFET transistors or be an amplifier for, like, a signal, because that's where our BJTs come in. And so, silicon wafers are pretty important in society. And it was cool. We went to, like, this fabrication plant in the EE220 uh, with Anna Lee. I'd highly suggest that class, but um, you got to see how the silicon wafer was actually made. So that was a fun one. So step number one to the silicon wafer process. What happens is I'm going to just describe this using pictures, and um, you can explain it, but I feel like pictures are the best route to go for this. We have something here, it looks like a seed shaft. So I'm just going to write seed shaft right here. And we have a piece right here on the seed shaft. So as this comes downwards, you can sort of think of it like as on the tip of like a marker here or something. Like, you know, like this marker is bringing it down sort of like the seed shaft to the level. But right here, what it has on its tip is solid silicon. Solid silicon. And then here, what we have is we have our uh, liquid silicon. So in this liquid down here, it's silicon. And it's in like a container, so, you know, like a bowl to hold the liquid in. And basically what's happening right now is the seed shaft is moving downwards to this liquid silicon that is in the bowl. And so what happens is finally, uh, for step two, the seed shaft is going to touch the surface of the liquid silicon. So here we have our solid silicon right here, and it's touching the surface of the liquid silicon right now. And so what happens when it touches the surface? Well, a surface tension is created between the solid silicon and the liquid silicon. And so when the shaft rises, the liquid silicon is going to follow the solid silicon. So what happens is when we start bringing the shaft upwards here, is now we brought it down to touch the sil liquid silicon, so it created a surface tension here, and then what's going to happen when we bring the shaft back up is that surface tension is going to cause some of the liquid to still be attached to that solid silicon. So it's sort of going to look like this, where this is now the liquid silicon still down here, but some of that liquid is attached to the solid silicon due to that surface tension that was created. And what we're going to see is there's going to be a slow cooling of the liquid will result in solid silicon. And so here, because it's going to be cooling outside this hot bubbling silicon down here, it's going to cool as it rises out of the liquid material. So we're going to see that this is now going to become solid silicon up here. And as we keep pulling it out, what it's going to look like is... So here's our seed shop. As it keeps coming up with that solid piece of silicon, it's going to have keep more and more of it's going to come out and it's going to form an inglet. So then finally when we get to the bottom and all the liquid, what this solid silicon is going to look like at the finish is when we pull it out an inglet shape. So it would have something like this. 
It sort of looks like a lemon. <laughs> Sorry, my drawing's not that good, but it looks like a lemon. Um, and so this is our solid silicon. And what we do to it, now with our inglet created, so I'll just say, this is our inglet. Uh, we basically cut it with a string saw. And so here you'll see cuts in it. And so our string saw is going to come in and it's used because it basically can create a very thin disc. And so that string saw will cut the inglet, then cut the inglet, cut the inglet, cut. So you can see like the four cuts I made in it right there. But that's going to produce our silicon wafer because we want thin silicon wafers. So we get more for um, our money because if we can produce more wafers from this inglet, if we cut them thinly, that is going to produce our wafer, which we want. And the silicon wafer looks something like this. And so finally, our silicon wafer is produced after uh, we use that string saw. Okay, so that's all the steps that goes into producing a silicon wafer. So silicon wafer production. Okay, so basically, just recapping this real quick, you have your seed shaft with the solid silicon, then you have your liquid bubbling silicon here. So you lower it into it, and then after you lower it in to create a surface tension here, so surface tension, you basically pull it back out, and when you pull it back out, a little bit's going to come out as well, the liquid, but it's cooler out here than bubbling inside this liquid silicon, so it's going to become a solid, now, as you keep pulling it out, it forms an inglet, and you use a string saw in order to make cuts in it and produce your silicon wafer. And so that is how silicon wafer is produced. And now that we discussed the silicon wafer production, basically, you can break the silicon wafer in order to make chips from it. And so you weaken the crystal structure because this is our crystal structure. It's uniform right now. But you can make chips in it uh, when you just weaken it by like, you know, like you can make a scratch in it or something. It can break off and then chips of that silicon wafer will be produced from it. And now that we covered the silicon wafer process, let's talk a little bit about intrinsic materials. And so intrinsic materials, what is an intrinsic material? Well, an intrinsic material... The best way I can say is it's pure. Where an extrinsic material is not pure. So a pure material, that is like um, if we had pure silicon, but an extrinsic material, um, the most common is due to doping. So that's where we have our n-type or p-type doping. So we either dope it more with electrons or more with holes. And so what you're going to see is oftentimes with intrinsic material, notations that are used are n sub i or p sub i. And uh, what this means is n sub i means concentration of electrons in the material where P sub I means concentration of holes in the material. And so uh, oftentimes you will see that notation, the lowercase i means intrinsic. And so now that we talked about intrinsic versus extrinsic, extrinsic basically just has doping in it, where the intrinsic is pure. Uh, for silicon at room temperature, this is an important number to know. At room temp, the electron concentration, the intrinsic concentration, is equal to the whole concentration, and that is 10 to the 10 per centimeter cube. And so that is at room temperature how much concentration there is of electrons and holes. And so we will see 
there is an equation here, but he said don't memorize this. But I like showing this equation just because I feel like it explains why with temperature um, it becomes more intrinsic as you increase the temperature. Because n sub i is equal to, and then there's some material property in here, it's like a number associated with it, but then it's t to the 3 halves e to the negative band gap all over 2kt. And so this would tell you, you know, like the intrinsic concentration. And so the important thing here was just to see as you increase the temperature, the material becomes more intrinsic. And so that's why you always have to dope it more if you have higher temperatures, because as the temperature increases, the main takeaway from here is as T increases, the material is more intrinsic. So it's going to lose those extrinsic properties if you doped it. Because as the temperature increases, that material is going to become more and more intrinsic. So that's why a lot of times they don't want, you know, your computer or something like to overheat because those semiconductors won't work anymore. So that's just the only reason I showed you that equation is because you'll see I he had characteristic curves, I remember, um, he had on beach board. But it basically just showed as the temperature increased to the right, the intrinsic concentration here increased as well. So the material became more intrinsic as the temperature increased. And uh, so don't know that equation. He didn't care. You don't need to memorize it. But just silicon at room temperature, the intrinsic concentration of holes is equal to the intrinsic concentration of electrons, which is 10 to the 10 per centimeter cubed. And now that we discussed uh, intrinsic and extrinsic, um, a little bit what I wanted to touch upon is that the two relationships here. These are the big ones. In an intrinsic semiconductor, The concentration of holes is equal to the concentration of electrons, right? Because in intrinsic, you haven't doped it. So the two are equal. However, uh, there is a relationship you need to know. The PN product rule. That works for intrinsic and extrinsic. It's to be upheld. And the PN product rule says that P times N is equal to n i squared. And so if these are intrinsic, you know, the concentration of holes would be equal to the concentration of electrons. So this would just become like n squared or p squared, you know, but if it was n squared, it's equal to, you know, the concentration, the intrinsic concentration squared. Uh, but the pn product rule works for both those extrinsic and intrinsic devices. So in an intrinsic semiconductor, remember the concentration of holes is equal to the concentration of electrons. And the PN product rule says that basically the concentration of electrons and holes multiplied by each other is equal to the intrinsic concentration squared. And now that we talked about that, um, charge carriers. Just This is just a repetition, I think, but just to clarify in case anyone Charge carriers, when we refer to those, those can either be electrons or holes. And so you guys know. And that talked a little bit about um, all the common types that you can see. But now we're going to get a little into the doping part of it. And so we're going to talk about acceptors and donors. And so column three materials in our periodic table are known as acceptors. And examples of these are boron, aluminum, and there's gallium. And so those are common column three materials. And the reason why is if we have a column three material, there's one less electron. So um, if I draw this out, 
palm three in the center. And let's say we surround it, you know, like in the diamond lattice and we have silicon atoms all on the other outside of it. Well, this column three material, um, it has three outer electrons. So there's one, two, three. Well, silicon provides, uh, it has four outside electrons, right? So it'd have another one here, another one here, another one here, and it'd have one up here. But since this column three material, um, it was lacking one. There is an empty hole here that needs to be filled. And so what can happen is oftentimes um, if this silicon, let's say, is paired with another silicon up here, that an electron here can actually um, jump in, fill this hole. But then uh, we can say that then that's going to leave behind a hole here if it does jump. And so that's what we refer to with acceptors, is an electron from another atom can fill the hole that's left behind, and that cycle repeats for our acceptors. And so what we're going to say here is that um, whenever we have acceptors, that's basically equal to our, so our hole concentration here is going to be equal to the number of holes in an intrinsic material plus the number of acceptors since those have another hole with them. And uh, if we dope it with a lot of acceptors, it's basically going to be that P is equivalent to N of A. Because if we have more acceptors than the intrinsic concentration of holes, then we're going to have uh, the P, the amount of holes we have in the material, is going to be almost equal to the number of acceptors from those column 3 materials. And so then here, um, remember when I told you guys the PN product rule, P of N is equal to NI squared? And so then... If we said here that P is, since it's doped heavily, I guess I should write that above here, doped heavily with acceptors, that's when we only care. Uh, doped heavily with acceptors. Then this relationship, let's just plug in for P here, it'd be N of A times the concentration of electrons equals to NI squared. And so we would get N is equal to NI squared all over NA. And so that's how that relationship is just derived in the book. Because they say that the concentration of then electrons is equal to the intrinsic concentration squared divided by the number of acceptors. Because they just take that P and product rule and based off the approximation we, met, we made when it's heavily doped, they substitute that back in for P here and they just divide. Now we're going to get into donors, which are basically column 5 materials. So column 5 materials are referred to as donors. And so they're the nice ones because they donate an electron, and the common examples of donors are phosphorus. <laughs> I know, I had three above, boron, aluminum, and gallium. Um, oh, I guess arsenide would count in this, but... Um, I just had phosphorus for column 5, the one we see the most. And so with column 5 materials, it's going to look something like this again, where we have our silicon, we have a silicon, and we have a silicon, and silicon. And so um, the column 5 has 1, 2, 3, I'm oh, sorry, um, when it's sharing with the silicon. Um, remember, it's perfect, except it has one extra electron here with all the bonds here. So this extra electron, let's say we have our silicon again paired here, this extra electron is going to interfere with maybe like the bond here, and that's going to cause then this electron to interfere with another bond out there. And so it's basically that electron, the extra electron that's there, it's going to knock out another electron, and then that one's going to cause another electron get knocked out. So this one... Uh, we can often say is like the electrons flowing more in the n-type material, whereas here it was a hole left behind, a hole left behind, so this was more like the hole, um, holes left behind, so like hole flow, I guess, more compared to this one, which is electron flow. And so what we have here, um, looking just back up comparing the two systems, the number of electrons is based off number of electrons in an intrinsic material, 
plus the number of donors introduced. But if we dope it heavily, we can say that n approximated to nd. So going back to our pn product rule here, if we just substitute n with nd, what we're going to get as a result is we're going to get p is equal to ni squared all over nd. And so that's how those two relationships are derived. Oh, sorry. And so that's how those relationships are derived. And now uh, the main thing about this is just remember that in p-type materials, holes determine the number of charge carriers. And so, in the n-type material, electrons determine the number of charge carriers. And so, uh, that's what we see here, is because if it's more heavily doped with acceptors, that means there's more holes in the material. And if it's more heavily doped with electrons um, or donor materials, that's what we mean by electrons are the majority of the charge carriers in that material. And so uh, that just sums up basically what lecture two is. It just focused on silicon wafer production, intrinsic materials, a pure material, extrinsic means that we have some doping involved, and then silicon at room temperature, the number, the concentration of electrons is equal to the whole intrinsic concentration, which is 10 to the 10th per centimeter cubed. And then as temperature increases, um, the intrinsic concentration increases as well, and the material becomes more intrinsic. In an intrinsic semiconductor, this relationship holds true, where the number of electrons is equal to the number of holes in an intrinsic material. The PN product rule holds true for intrinsic and extrinsic materials. In the number of acceptors, those are column three materials. And oftentimes we're going to see boron, aluminum, and gallium, whereas in column five, it's mostly phosphorus. Acceptors mean that they have one hole in... Uh, so they have only three electrons, where donors have five electrons. And then we can just derive how it changes that PN product rule relationship. And which one determines in a donors, electrons are the majority charge carriers, where in acceptors, holes are the majority charge carriers. Now we're going to move on. So basically, that lecture covered most of lecture three as well. So we're going to go to lecture four. So lecture four, what does this focus on? And so this is going to look at the band gap diagram. So revisiting that for uh, n-type materials and p-type materials. So when we have our uh, donors, so for an n-type material, if we look at our band gap diagram again, so where this is our conduction band and this is our valence band, uh, basically you're going to have, um, because it's n-type, there's going to be more electrons um, in the material, so it's going to conduct easier. So we just show that by showing these electrons right below the conduction band, since they only need a little energy required since it can conduct easier, and they can jump into the conduction band. And we say these states right here are due to it being a donor material, since there's more electrons in the material. Meanwhile, for p-type material, there's more holes, of course. So what it looks like, it's sort of the opposite, where we have our conduction band and we have our valence band, but there are more holes present in the material. So right down here, uh, due to that scepter material, so I'm going to call that E of A, creates these states, there are holes right here. So when an electron, it's going to have to fill those states before it can jump up here. And so um, that's why holes are the majority carriers here. So it causes uh, basically there to be these empty states near the valence band. Whereas in the n-type material, the donor material, there's more electrons. So therefore, it's easier to go into the conduction band here. And so um, if a material is pure, basically, 
electron hole pair generation and recombination are responsible for conductivity. And so, um, that's going to lead into the next idea, so I want to make sure we cover that. So, in a pure material, electron hole pair uh, generation and recombination are responsible for and then uh, conductivity. Meanwhile, we use dopants, uh, we're going to see later on, and dopants are going to be used to control the motion of carriers. We will use dopants to control the motion of Okay, so uh, going back basically to the motion of carriers in a solid is what that's going to look like is we have basically like let's say an electron here and it moves due to random thermal motion. And so that's what we call it right here, random thermal motion is responsible for the movements of carriers in a solid. And so uh, there's no net motion basically of the carrier, so they're just going anywhere in uh, that solid, but we can make a force to sort of make them go in a direction that we want. So in order to control the direction of those charged carriers, we're going to attach a voltage source here. So if we want electrons, uh, basically, to uh, flow through our material, of course, uh, we're going to connect our voltage source up to it. And so uh, what we're going to see here, sorry, just pretend that's connected, connected here. Okay, so this, remember, if we're having electrons feed in from the voltage source because the negative terminal is here, it's going to cause them to repel since there's um, more electrons because an electron field is generated. And the electron field is gonna be going from the right-hand side here, where the positive is, the positive end, to the negative end, of, because of the battery. The battery creates the electric field here. And so it goes from the positive to the negative side. And so therefore, uh, remember, electrons move in the direction opposite the electric field holes, uh, which are like, the, Positively, I sort of don't like to say that, but uh, because they have no really charge to them, but um, holes move in the direction of the electric field. And so um, what we need to know from here, though, is random thermal motion is a lot greater than the electric field um, is upon the motion of the carriers. However, um, the electric field creates a little force, you know, so like a little push to that random thermal motion to sort of direct it in that way. And so uh, that's oftentimes how we use a directed force in order to get those charge carriers to move. So a directed force is due to the electric field. And so now that we have discussed that, we're going to talk about the amount of drift. So for amount of drift, and remember drift is always due to the electric field where diffusion is due to the gradient. Um, basically, the amount of drift when we talk about our drift velocity, it's due to um, the presence of the electric field. Because remember, drift, it's always due to the electric field. So when I'm going to talk about our drift velocity, it's going to be the mobility of those charge carriers. So how mobile are they? Times the presence of the electric field. And the mobility for uh, charge carriers 
if we're looking, and remember charge carriers are either electrons or holes, the mobility for electrons is 1350, and uh, for holes it is 480, and then it's centimeters squared all over um, volts per second. Usually you don't need to know the units because they usually cancel in the equation, but uh, if you want, just know that electrons have the greater um, mobility than those of holes. And so um, it's easier for them to flow for the material. And just remember, drift is due to the presence of an electric field. And so therefore, our drift velocity is due to the mobility of our carrier. So how mobile, how mobile are they? Times the electric field. And now we're going to, um, when we look at the drift current, you can derive it and everything, and that's great and all, but legit, we just care about the formulas. <laughs> and so, um, J total is equal to, and then it's going to be um, the drift current due to the electrons plus the drift current due to the holes. And so that is our total drift current is due to the presence of those two charge carriers. And so it's going to be the charge multiplied by, and then the mobility, um, of, and then here we'll just have our electrons times the number of electrons we have in there, the concentration, plus the mobility of our, uh, oops, sorry, mobility of our holes multiplied by our hole concentration, and remember drift current is due to the presence of an electric field being there. So the difference um, here compared to our drift velocity is the only thing we take into account additionally is the concentration and also the charge on it. And so, um, oh yeah, hopefully that raised it enough. Basically, um, what we need to know from here is just remember drift current, whenever we talk about it, uh, it's a contribution by both of the charge carriers. So those are the electrons and those are the holes and that's equal to the charge times the mobility of um, those charges times their intrinsic concentration, add them together, and then multiply that, because remember, drift is due to the presence of electric field, so you have to multiply it again by the electric field out there. And then um, that is how you get uh, your drift current. And now we're going to talk a little bit about diffusion. So remember I told you guys drift is due to the electric field, diffusion is due to... Um, the gradient between it. So we're going to look a little bit at what diffusion is. Diffusion we have here is going to be the net motion of carriers and that's going to be from regions of high concentration to low concentration. Because, um, think if you're, like, in a crowd, and no one likes being in a crowd, right? You want, like, your own space. So if there's, like, 500,000 people who are in one room, and there's another room with only, like, 30, you're probably going to go to everyone in order to reach equilibrium, they're going to drift over. So there's an equal amount in each of the rooms. So, um, what it looks like is, let's say... We have it, like, everyone is stacked on this side, and, like, that's great and all, but, like, there's only, like, one person over here. <laughs> that sort of sucks for that person. <laughs> but, um, with time, what it's going to look like is it's going to become, like, equally balanced within our system. So it's going to look something like that due to diffusion. And so it's just because of the gradient, there's a lot of um, concentration here, and then there's low concentration here. So it just equalizes. And... Now that we talked about all those, uh, we talked about drift being due to the presence of electric field. Um, we looked at these two um, in n-type materials. There's um, states that are closer to the conduction band since there's more electrons in there. And in p-type, there are states that are closer to the valence band since there's more holes in the material. And so... Um, what we're going to see is that uh, drift is due to the effect of the electric field here, so that's how the charge carriers 
um, are moving, whereas our diffusion is due to a concentration gradient from regions of high concentration to low concentration. Okay, and so that's basically lecture four in a little snippet. Now we're going to look at lecture five. So this sort of goes back to the idea I presented in lecture four. And so this says, dopants are introduced. To control the conductivity. rather than temperature. And so what we're going to see is in a dope material, conductivity is controlled. So the electric field density determines the current density. And oftentimes, uh, where we're going to see this applied mostly was when we talk about our diffusion current. So I want to bring up this relationship we studied. It's a little um, similar to the one we made for drift current. So diffusion current is going to be equal to the diffusion current by electrons and the diffusion current due to holes. So that means like if they're um, how they move in response to the concentration radiants. And so it would be the charge multiplied by dn dn dx minus dp dp dx. And so uh, what we're going to see here is that dn and dp, those are just diffusion constants, whereas um, the dn dx and dp dx, that just represents the concentration gradient, this one of the electrons, concentration gradient of the holes. And so uh, what we're going to see is that um, these two, uh, basically what they're going to cause is, we'll see the Einstein relationship is derived from this, which is d over mu is equal to kt over q. And that relationship, you can plug back into this formula in order to get back at it. But just Einstein created this relationship, which was like nice, you can substitute in. And he basically said that our um, diffusion constant can be related to basically the mobility and the temperature um, of the material. And so that was just like a little snippet, I guess, diffusion, what he wanted us to see from these equations was just due to the present presence of a concentration gradient, that's where the diffusion current is going to be created from. And um, he just had this, but I feel like you won't get tested on the formula. You just need to know that diffusion is caused by a concentration gradient. That's what he just wanted us to get from it. And then um, equilibrium. Now that we've seen these two formulas here, uh, going back to lecture four and lecture five, so we saw drift current and we see diffusion current, two formulas. When they're equal to each other, when drift is equal to diffusion, that means that it's going to be at equilibrium since um, the currents will be equal to each other. And so since the currents are going to be equal to one another, there's not going to be a flow of current, since they're both equal, they're going to cancel each other out. So that's when we reach our equilibrium state. So drift current is equal to diffusion current. And remember, uh, we also said at equilibrium later on, going back, um, is the rate of generations equal to the rate of recombination of holes. So that idea was presented as well at equilibrium. And so we see these two things occurring at equilibrium. Is our drift current and diffusion current are equal as well.
And so how do we get a gradient of carriers, though? How is there a concentration of one on one side than one on the other? Well, that's due to injection. And so let's say we have our material here. If I want to basically make there be a gradient of carriers, I'm going to inject carriers from this left-hand side here. So this is going to be my injection. And that's going to cause there to be a lot of carriers over on this side. So like, and then they're going to slowly diffuse over to the other side. So then we'll see, you know, like there will be starting to diffuse out here to the right. And so that's basically how um, diffusion occurs. And so it goes from high to low. And so until they diffuse all out, then once they diffuse all out, that's basically going to be equilibrium since they're all diffused out. And then our drift current will equal our diffusion current. And so the main takeaways, I repeated them before, is drift. This is what he wants you to know, not those equations as much, I feel, is caused by the electric field diffusion is caused by, and this is going to be random thermal motion. In the presence of a gradient. Because they'll start distributing equally. Presence of a gradient. Okay, so that's what I want you to take away more from this. Right here. That's the biggest idea about drift and diffusion. One's caused by the electric field, where the other's caused by random thermal motion in the presence of a gradient, is those charge carriers are going to move in order to distribute equally. And then he gets a little into how a PN junction is made. And so how is a PN junction actually created? And so what we're going to see for this is I'm going to label this how to make a PN junction. So how would we go about making a PN junction? Well, we need P-type material and we need N-type material, right? So remember group three materials I said were aluminum, boron, gallium. So I'm just going to choose aluminum up here. So that is going to be our P-type material. So I can label that like P-type. Where I said our N-type, that's usually like phosphorus um, in other stuff. But um, if we dope silicon, you know, with N-type material, that can make it as well. Um, we usually use our semiconductor. Um, so we'll have our N-type silicon here. And what we're going to see is n-type silicon with the p-type aluminum is if we heat up this aluminum, because, you know, aluminum, we often hear about it, like, as one of our metals, but um, if we heat it up, it's going to melt, right? Because any metal, when you heat it up a lot, it's going to melt, so it's going to slowly melt into the n-type material. And when it slowly melts, so heat it up, woohoo! And so when you heat it up, there's going to be our n-type silicon down here, n-type silicon. And there's going to be our p-type aluminum right here. So um, basically, sorry, the p-type material is going to get created right here. So I'm going to show that's where our p-type material is. So our p type silicon and that's where aluminum is it's because um some of that p type from our aluminum gets then melted into the silicon so there's where p n junction is formed because we have p material um surrounded by the n material below it and so we have our p n junction from this okay there was two types of epitaxies. And so when I look on my phone at what is epitaxy, because um, that is a word we're probably not familiar with, it basically says 
the natural or artificial growth of crystals on a crystalline substance determining their orientation. And so when I just look at it with an image, let's see what epitaxy looks like in basically um, something like this, like it just shows like you deposit basically um, a one crystalline film like on a non crystal one crystalline substrate. Basically, it just means depth position. So like you're depositing something and uh, above. Uh, something else. That's the main thing I think to take away what epitaxy means. So epitaxy because um, epi means above and then taxi means depositing. So liquid phase epitaxy that means you're gonna deposit liquid on top of a material and then vapor phase means you're going to um, deposit the vapor on top of the material. And so here for the liquid phase versus so liquid phase epitaxy then here we have vapor phase epitaxy okay and so liquid phase epitaxy basically we have our end type material here and we have our liquid and we move that liquid to the right so like it's coming above it and it, it, we like it slowly deposits on top of this n-type material here and so this could be like p-type silicon liquid so p silicon above our n substrate and we move the material to the right whereas this one to the right here it's going to be our n uh type and we have our p uh at the very oh oops sorry ignore that uh, this is the end result product because we deposit uh, the liquid silicon on top of the end um, type substrate so then we get um, our p material on top of the end and so that is the liquid phase it makes sense since we're just slowly depositing the liquid on top of the end substrate as we go to the right so as i told you guys taxi means deposit and epi means above so liquid phase epitaxy means you're depositing some liquid on top of another material and here the other material would be the n type and we're depositing the p type material over it now we're going to get into vapor phase epitaxy so this means we're depositing like vapor on top of it right so basically um he had a chemical formula for this. He just showed that like aluminum chloride plus silicon chloride plus hydrogen is going to give you silicon plus hydrogen chloride plus um, aluminum. But uh, I feel like the main thing just to know from vapor phase, because I don't want to know that formula, um, it's just like a vapor on top of the material and it's going to our n-type silicon is like on the bottom um and substrate you can call it and uh as you have that vapor over it's going to deposit some of the drops on it and then that's going to form a p-type material on top p-type and you're going to have your n-type below so it's just another way i like the liquid phase more than the vapor phase it makes more sense to me but both of those can be used, and then you can also create it based just off the one heating it up, and you heat it up, and it deposits into it. Um, so those are the two, uh, or three different methods. You can just do it by heating like aluminum, which is a p-type material, over the n-type silicon, creates that p-n junction here. You can do liquid phase epitaxy, where you slide the boiling p-type silicon on top of the n-type. And then you can um, do the vapor phase, where you have your vapor, and basically um, it has droplets of the p-type material that goes on top of the n-type silicon. So that covers uh, lecture 5, and the main takeaways was just how the p-n junction form Drift is caused by our electric field and diffusions due to the random thermal motion due to the concentration uh, gradient. Okay, now that we talked about that, let's get into lecture six. So lecture six, what we have here is we're going to be talking 
little bit about the equations we have. So I know that sucks, but it's something we have to be aware of. And so, lecture 6 here. And I think the best way to actually present the diagram below is drawing out the PN junction first. So we have our P-type material here on the left, and we have the N-type on the right. And so then we have, um, you know, we have holes on the P-type material here, where we have electrons on the N-type material. And then we have a depletion region in here, we know. And that depletion region is due to the movement of charge carriers. And so we're going to have... Um, in between here, when we have the carriers move over to the other side, they leave behind ions. And so for the P-type material, um, if a hole moves over, it's going to leave behind a negative charge here, negatively charged ion, where if an electron moves over to the other side, it leaves behind a positively charged ion. So we have our PN junction here. An electric field will be created, that's the main thing you have to take away from this, from the positive ions to the negative ions, because there is a separation of charge. That's where we say our electric field is. But this relates to the doping profile. And that's why I wanted to bring this up, because um, if we look at the doping profile graph, I'm going to draw it right here down the center of that PN junction I created above. So we have the number of acceptors minus the number of donors. And then we're going to have, as we move over in our length of our junction, so I'm just going to call this X as we move to the right. Um, and basically, what we're going to see is we have a lot of holes on this side. So on the left-hand side here, P to the 18th, where we have more electrons here on the right-hand side. So uh, that's like... 10 to the 16. Uh, these are values he has in his head. Still working to try to know them. <laughs> I'm not Einstein, but um, basically the amount of holes here on this side is going to be equal to 10 to the 18th, and the amount of electrons on this side is 10 to the 16th. And so um, it just shows that the electron concentration down here versus the hole concentration. And so um, it's more heavily doped with the holes than the electrons we can see. But um, what we need to know is that within this depletion region here, um, that's, so we can call this like right here and about like right here, I would say, like depletion region, try and match it up with the graph. Um, this is where he oftentimes references like x of n and x of p. And so uh, that's uh, then where our n-type material will start and then our p-type material is going to start uh, outside those boundaries. I think he refers to this with a negative x of p. But uh, basically when he refers to a metallurgical junction, the metallurgical junction is right here in the dead center where this intersects the origin here. And when he says the metallurgical junction... What he refers to is that um, it acts like pure material. Because here, what we're going to see is at this point, if we're graphing N of A minus N of D, is the number of acceptors up here minus the number of donors. So that's why when we have larger donors, it's in the negative plot of the curve, where if we have more acceptors, it's in the positive region. And so, um, the metallurgical junction is where it's intrinsic since the number of acceptors is equal to the number of donors. And so that's what we're going to see. And um, the biggest thing, though, um, here just to know is just how you can derive this graph just by looking at your PN junction. And that's the important thing to take away. And there's two types of junctions that you will see. I'm just going to... Um, the next curve comes from this, so I don't want to intersect this drawing, but I'm going to show it here. 
you can have a graded junction here. And this graded junction is a linear junction where we have an abrupt junction, which it's pretty... That depletion region is pretty small, where this depletion region is larger, so therefore it's more linear. Where this depletion region is really small, so therefore the difference between the N and the P-type material, it's so scrunched together in that PN junction that there's barely any uh, of those ions in between, where here there's more ions since there's a larger depletion region. And so that's where you'll see the two. And... Um, now that we have talked about it, um, the biggest thing we're going to see is due to the diffusion, you know, carriers to the other side, you know, how holes can jump over to the other side and electrons will jump over to the other side. And um, that diffusion sets up a separation of charge since um, there are now what's left behind these ions, which creates an electric field. And this electron electric field makes it even harder for these holes to cross to the other side because holes move in the direction of the electric field and these electrons it's even harder for them now to jump to the other side since they go in the direction opposite of the electric field and so um only those carriers with enough thermal energy can diffuse to the other side so that's the big thing i think that we need to say is that diffusion when they jump to the other side it basically sets up a separation of charge which creates an electric field and that makes it harder to diffuse because now it's even harder for these carriers to jump over since this electric field is a force that causes so makes it harder to diffuse and um, only those with enough energy can jump to the other side. So that's uh, what we have there. And, um, oh, that graph just looks like this. Just graded junction versus step junction here. Just all you need to know is the graded is like a linear junction because there's a larger depletion region. And the step is like a step junction because there's a very short depletion region. So if we zoom out, this one's going to look more just like a step, where this one's going to look more like a linear. And this is recorded, so you can always refer back to that diagram. And so, now that we talked about it, um, let's look at charge density here. And so, charge density... Okay, uh, I kept this graph here because I just wanted to show um, one thing from it. Uh, this How this graph relates to charge density. So, going back here... Um, we need to remember, he said something in the lecture that was important. The width of the depletion region is due to the width of the lightly doped side. So the side that is more lightly doped is going to determine the width of the depletion region. And so what we saw here is that there was more holes than electrons, correct? So therefore it is the lightly doped side, the width of the depletion region, there was, um, because the electrons were the more lightly doped side, when we draw this charge density graph, what it's going to look like. Is there's charge density, so that's where a row comes in, and negative x of p compared to x of n here. And because it was more heavily uh, doped with our um, holes compared to electrons, that's why our charge density curve looks like this. And so um, these areas are um, going to be equal. I should have made this go down more, but they do equal each other. And what we're going to see, basically, is that um, these represent the ions in the depletion region. Sorry. 
<laughs> I should have. In depletion region. But the major thing just to recall from this is that the width of the depletion region is determined by the width of the lightly doped side. And um, as we see in this charge density curve, um, of course, there is going, because we had more holes than electrons, there was more of a charge density of ions for on the lightly doped side compared to um, the whole side. And so uh, our electric field, though, it's determined by this relationship of charge density. And so when we look at the electric field, one big thing to take away from it is look at the charge density curve because the electric field, an important relationship to keep in the back of your mind, it's equal to the integral charge density times dx. And so the change in x, so as we go along this curve here, we have our electric field and we have our x. What we're going to see is the integral of this and the integral of this. So if we keep going to write, of course, that's more positive area. But as we take the integral here, you know, we have some area, but... Uh, Basically, what's going to look like is because remember I said the areas are equal under these curves. I know it doesn't, okay, maybe I should make it look more like this so they look equal. There we go. So, um, but this occurs for a shorter time, just know that, compared to this one. And so, because there's more, um, because it's more the lightly doped side, so therefore there's more of those donor ions over a longer distance since the width of the depletion region is determined by the lightly doped side. So therefore, there's more ions on the lightly doped side. So therefore, the charge density, it carries out a longer length compared to the heavily doped side. And so if we look at the electric field here, what it's going to look like, it's going to look something like this and there. So this is our electric field because it's the integral. So the area, if we take the area under this curve right here, it's negative, right? If we take the area under this curve here, it's positive, right? So we're going to see negative area down here. So it's going to be a negative line, and then we get positive area, so a positive line. That's how we get electric field, because it's the integral of the charge density. Now we're going to go to voltage, which is the integral of the electric field, but remember it's the negative side. So voltage V is equal to negative integral of electric field, so E dx. And so how we're going to see this is it's going to actually equal... And then you can actually do, is if we know what electric field is equal to, you can substitute that in here. So it would be P and then DX. So you could do that as well. And then you could put a square in, or DX, DX, um, if you want to, but, um, and make that DX squared. But um, the main thing just to look at this is just from the graph of the electric field, you can determine the voltage. Remember, though, that negative sign in there, that's from your physics 152. You should have been taught this definition right here. This should be known already. Um, and so um, what this does is it literally just takes the area below this, but then remember it flips it. So if we take the area, if we're flipping this to the other side, the area is going to increase. And then here, it's more area than after this point, there's no more area. And so what the voltage graph is going to look like is it's going to look something like this. And that's going to be our voltage, and here's going to be x. Okay, that's what I got. And then, um, now that we talked about that, the biggest thing to know, there is um, an equation which literally goes for this long derivation, and that's not what we should be testing on. But um, what you need to know is there's a voltage created, right? Because there's a separation of charge, and there's the presence of an electric field. Remember I told you guys voltage is equal to the negative integral of electric field dx. So since there's a presence of electric field, there must be a voltage. And so therefore, there's a voltage created in this device since there is electric field due to the electric field created in that depletion region from the ions that were formed. Okay, and so um, there's that really long derivation here and like that sucks. Don't do that. <laughs> and so now that we talked about that, we're going to get into the ideal diode equation. And so the ideal diode equation, what is that? Ideal diode. 
straight up know this equation. Um, this is the one of two. Know the PN product rule, know the ideal diode equation. So an ideal diode is equal to the saturation current going through it times EVD divided by VT minus one. That's perfect. However, you need to know if it's in forward bias or reverse bias or you did everything wrong. Okay, so forward bias. Let's look at the curve. And so uh, basically our curve is going to look something like this. And we're going to have our, um, you know that uh, what a diode looks like precisely. Um, we're used to seeing it like, is it different? Something like this. You know, like where this is like at 0 0.7 volts. Or, but in forward bias, what you need to know is the equation is I of S E V D V T, where this one is negative I of S. And so when it's in forward bias, that equation reads I S V D V T. When it's in reverse bias, the equation reads I diode is equal to IS times negative 1. And so that's what you'll read in forward, uh, I mean in reverse bias. So reverse bias is negative I of S, in forward bias it's I of S E V D V T. And so um, that's the main thing just to know from the ideal diode equation. Uh, just memorize this formula and know when to apply it in forward bias and when to apply it in reverse bias. Okay, now that we've focused on that, um, and we've seen it, let's get into uh, the next one, which talks about when diodes, the applications of them. So that will be lecture seven. So lecture 7. An array of diodes and resistors shape the waveform, so you know that. Uh, so that's why uh, we'll have this triangular wave here, something like this. <laughs> that's a really bad triangular wave. But um, it's going to become the sine wave, something like that. And so that's just due to an array of diodes. Because they adjust the waveform. And so that's what we're going to see here. And um, Power supplies convert the sine wave from power, um, basically, lines to a DC supply. And so um, we're going to see that most of the time. And we're going to see protection circuits are another application of diodes. And they're going to um, use diodes uh, with either two Zener diodes in series or two diodes of reverse polarity in parallel with each other. And so we need to know what types of diodes there are. And so uh, an array of diodes is basically um, is used to change the waveform. So let's talk about the main types of diodes. And so um, we have a fair amount of diodes here. And uh, the silicon rectifier diode. So silicon rectifier. I'm just going to list the voltages you guys should know. It's going to be about 0 0.7 volts. Uh, for the shock key, barrier diode, it's 0 0.3 volts. For the red LED, it's 1.8 volts. For the green LED, it's 2 volts. For the blue LED, it's 3 volts. And for the Zener diode, it's about uh, 10 volts reverse bias, but it is 0 0.7 volts forward bias. And all the others here, I just wrote them specifically in forward bias. Just so you know. Okay. Now that we talked about all the different types of diodes um, and when you should use them for the voltages, um, what those 
curves should look like when they turn on at. Um, let's look at an example and let's try to solve it. And then we're going to, um, okay, let me real quick before, I feel like these two curves you should know just before I jump into this. So I'm going to show, uh, let's just look at the silicon one here and we're going to look at a zener. So silicon, uh, what that looks like is, you know, it turns on at like 0 0.7 volts, right? But there's like some leakage current here and like it goes on forever and ever and then it's finally going to break down, but we don't know when. But um, the silicon rectifier is like 0 0.7 volts and that's what it looks like. But the zener are specifically designed so we know the reverse bias voltage. So it occurs around 10 volts and then, um, you know, there's some leakage current, but then at 0 0.7 volts, uh, that's where it turns on in forward bias. But silicon uh, rectifier diodes, they turn on uh, 0 0.7 volts, but we don't know when the reverse bias um, voltage is. It's really large, like in the hundreds, we don't know when it is. But Zener, they're specifically designed so you can operate in reverse bias voltage. Okay, now let's do the example. And for example, we're going to do this one here. So we're going to look at the circuit. So for an example, what we're going to have is a voltage source, plus minus 5. And it's going to have a resistor here. We're going to have diode, and we're going to have it. Back to the circuit. Okay, and so that was a bad arrow. Okay, uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to have a 10 ohm resistor here, and this is going to be like our voltage from the diode. We don't know specifically the diode's voltage, uh, but we have to find the current going through the circuit. Well, let's make a KVL equation. And so for a KVL equation, it's going to start from the source, and then we're going to add the resistor's um, voltage contribution. Then we're going to add the diode's voltage contribution, set it all equal to zero. And so in order to um, find out what the voltage of the diode is, remember how I told you guys the ideal diode equation, ID is equal IS, EVD, VT minus 1. We'll solve for voltage, and so then that'd be, um, if we're in forward bias, operating in the forward bias, since this is a DC source, um, it's not an AC because there's no AC wave, but in forward bias, remember I told you guys it's really just equal to ID is equal to IS, E, V, D, V, T, and then divide and take the natural log, so what you should get is ID, IS, natural log of this is equal to, um, Natural log will cancel out the E term, so it's just going to be VD, VT, but then multiply VD, VT on the other side. And um, VT, we know, is going to be equal to 0 0.026 millivolts at 300 Kelvin. And that's just a number um, from the textbook that I recall. But um, there's an issue here, is because this is dealing with a natural log and this is dealing with something that's linear and so we have a linear and a natural log um, component where this is following some relationship not to this one so we're just going to guess the voltage of the diode so i'm just you make one guess and you go from there so i'm just going to say let's assume the voltage of the diode is equal to 0 0.7 volts and let's just test it out and see if that works so it'll be negative 5 plus 10 i plus 0 0.7 is equal to 0. This would be negative 4.3, so that would be 4.3 if we move it on the other side. Divide by 10 is equal to i. Do it on my calculator. 4.3 divided by 10. Uh, okay, we got 0 0.43. Okay, uh, 0 0.43, plug it back in and see if it gives you um, the result you wanted. So negative 5 plus 10 times 0 0.43 amps plus 0 0.7 is equal to 0. Let's see if this equation holds true. Um, 
So negative 5 plus 10 times 0.43 times plus 0.7. And I got... Negative 5 plus 10 times 0.43... W5 minus, yeah, 4.3 divided by 10. Yes, yes. Let's see what's on side. Delta plus 4.3 divided Yeah, and so when I did that on my calculator, I got 0 is equal to 0. So we guessed the correct voltage of the diode from this. And so if that doesn't work, however, and let's say you assume the wrong diode voltage, you're going to do something that's greater, and you're going to do something that's less in voltage. And you're going to see which one is going to make this equation hold true. And so now that we talked about it, uh, we found the current going for the circuit, which was 0 0.43 amps. So that's what we were looking for here. So I diode is equal to 0 0.43 amps. That is the answer to um, the question. Now that we have talked about that, I'm oh, sorry, let me move that up. Um, I'm going to go over all the graphs specifically, and I feel these graphs are really important that he covered because they explain a lot. So I'm going to try doing my best because I felt like it was unclear a little in lecture uh, on these. And so we're going to start just um, at equilibrium, and then we're going to get into forward bias, and then we're going to get into reverse bias. So I'm going to try doing my best, so ask questions if you have any at the end of the three, because I'll explain all three, and then ask if you have any afterwards, okay? So uh, we're going to focus on three scenarios. We're going to have an equilibrium one. We're going to have a forward bias. And then we're going to have a reverse bias. Okay, so we got three types um, of conditions the system can be at. And so I'm going to draw the circuits for all these. And so um, our PN junction, you see what that's going to look like. And forward bias, we're going to have it here. How I always like to think of my source um, is the positive terminal is always connected to the P side, negative terminal is always at the N side, and um, here in our P type it's going to be holes of course, right? So I'm going to just put holes, 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 electrons, 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 and then um, we're going to have our depletion region inside here. So I'm just going to have negative, 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 and then like positive, 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 positive. And then those are donor ions inside there. And basically what's happening is we know at equilibrium, I told you guys this earlier, drift is equal to diffusion and electron hole pair generation is equal to electron hole pair recombination. Recombination. So we know our two equilibrium conditions must be satisfied. So let's draw it out and let's see what it actually looks like using the specific type of diagrams he showed us. So for this one, what it's going to be, and this one here, what's going to be? EC here, and this one is EB. And so, um, we're going to have our electrons, of course, and then we're going to have our holes. And so, we can see that uh, when we cut it off here, we cut it off here because this one does not, uh, these are going to turn around because they can't um, go around and these are going to turn around. Okay, the best way of thinking about this, let me try now putting this diagram, is basically electrons, um, 
if we're looking at the regions, because here we have more holes, of course, in our p-type region, then here we have more electrons in our n-type region. And so, um, think of holes like bubbles. It's harder for them to go downwards, where electrons, think of them like going up a hill. It's harder for them to go upwards. And so these ones won't have enough energy to go up, but this one here can still go. These holes can't go downwards because they don't have enough force enough pushing them down like air bubbles, where this one here is able to go um, down into our, our valence band. So this is just showing that it's at equilibrium, there is some movement of carriers because this electron can go to the other side. And this hole here can go to the other side, just like up here in the junction. The charge carriers, some holes can go over and some electrons can go over. However, um, it's not difficult, but it's not easy. It's at equilibrium, so some can and some can't. Then we're going to look at um, the amount of energy required here. Since it is just um, our basic diagram right here, it's going to be equal to Q times V of J. So the charge times the junction voltage. So the energy to cross the junction is going to be the charge times the potential. And um, right now, that's what it looks like at equilibrium. It's just general concept. When you're supposed to interpret this diagram, some electrons can diffuse over, some holes can diffuse over to the other side. However, it's not easy nor difficult at equilibrium. And now we're going to look at the forward bias condition. The forward bias condition, remember how in forward bias the width of the depletion region decreases? So it makes it easier for electrons and holes to diffuse. So here's my P and my N. And remember I told you I always could hook up my voltage source of so the positive ends to the P side, the negatives to the N. So voltage forward is greater than zero. And we're going to have um, our holes here. And um, there's going to be a smaller depletion region. So I'm going to draw it like this. So smaller ions in the center is there's a smaller depletion region. And then we have our electrons. Okay. And so in forward bias, when I'm looking here, is we have a smaller depletion region, right? So it's going to be easier for those charge carriers to go from one side to the other. So I barely have any difficulty. So if we look back at our electrons here, a lot of them now will be able to go to the other side. And if we look at our holes here, a lot of them will be able to go to the other side. And so hopefully that makes sense with the forward bias is this potential now, it's going to be the ch um, charge times the junction. In our junction voltage, since there's a smaller electric field, remember how I said voltage is equal to the integral? So here we go from positive to the negative side. So voltage, remember I said is equal to the negative integral of E dx. So since we have a smaller electric field, because there's a smaller depletion region, we have less voltage. And so, um, what we see from this diagram is that our junction voltage is going to decrease because the voltage of the junction is equal to the voltage um, originally, when it's just at equilibrium, minus the forward bias voltage. And therefore, it's going to create a smaller junction, since this is a positive number and that's a positive number. Um, Whereas when you do the reverse bias, what we're going to see here is that for reverse bias conditions, um, 
our P and our N, the depletion region is going to be pretty large. So I'm just going to emphasize that here <laughs> and make it really large just so you know the difference between the two. Um, and so we're going to have a lot of donors here. And um, I still hook up the voltage source the same. And voltage reverse is less than zero because we apply a negative voltage here for reverse voltage. And then we're going to have an even larger gap between the two. So, okay, so E of C and E of V. Okay, what we're going to see basically here is our holes on this side. And then our electrons on this side. It's literally so all of them are going to basically not be able to climb and jump. All of them are stuck. None of them can diffuse over to the other side. It's too hard because the depletion region is too large. And so what we're going to see here is there's a lot more voltage required. I mean energy required, sorry, in order to jump. And so this QBJ... The junction voltage is equal to the voltage minus, and remember since it's a negative, because our voltage reverse, it's negative V of R, this actually becomes V of O, the original at equilibrium, plus the reverse bias voltage. So that's why our junction potential is greater to overcome. And so hopefully that made sense. If you have any questions, ask now about these three diagrams but I tried re-explaining them so it made more sense from the lecture. Okay. Now, if we covered that, um, let's get into the wave shaping part. So that's going to be lecture number eight. Oh, pause real quick. Uh, wait, give me a sec. Okay, uh, now let's get into lecture eight, wave shaping. And so, lecture eight, which basically just shows um, when wave shaping, they can ask as clippers, they can act as clamps, they can act as limiters. And so, um, basically, when we do wave shaping, um, you often see this in two ways. And we saw this in lab, and then we saw this in his example, so I feel the best way to show it is going to be by working for the examples he posted on Beachboard. So, um, let me just pull those up here, and we will walk through it. So let me put this on the right-hand side. Let me put this on the left-hand side. Because there's two types of protection circuits that you want to be familiar with. So let me pull it up. Here it is. Okay. And let me actually get this. Okay, so here for the wave shaping ones, with the ones we're going to look at in particular is number four and number five. Those are the ones. So let me just draw those two out here and let's solve them because it's better we just solve them and we'll see if we're wrong. And if we're wrong, we'll just learn from it and we'll double check it against his and see what he has to say from it as well. Okay, so basically within this diagram here, we have one diode in forward bias and one in reverse bias. And then we're trying to determine the voltage output. 
We have a 6K ohm resistor here, and we have a 3K ohm resistor here. And then we have 4 volts RMS sign. And it says plot the voltage from the source and the voltage output. And so um, if we have to plot the voltage from the source, that's pretty easy. We're able to do that. So remember, just it's a sine wave, of course. So the top of the sine wave is going to be 4 rad 2. The bottom of the sine wave is going to be negative 4 rad 2. And um, what we're going to see for a sine wave, it's going to look something like this. And uh, that's going to be voltage from our source, E S T. And so if I just compute for rad two to have a better understanding of where that lies at, it's going to be five point six six, about roughly five point six six. Um, so it's approximately where that's located at, and. Um, now that we see, uh, remember just uh, fill, if we go from RMS to voltage peak, I guess voltage RMS, you multiply by rad 2. However, if you go to voltage peak to peak, you multiply by 2 rad 2, because now you have to go both ways. And so that's my conversion right there from voltage RMS to voltage peak, and then to voltage peak peak. And... Now that we talked about that, um, let's discuss uh, how are we going to determine the voltage output here. These are silicon rectifier diodes is what he wants us to assume they are. So remember I told you guys the diodes, um, there are going to be 0 0.7 volts in forward bias, and that's um, their voltage drop. So in forward bias, this is what I'm writing next to them. This is not writing reverse bias conditions, it's only forward bias. 0 0.7 and 0 0.7. That's going to represent in forward bias what voltage drops will be across them. Biggest thing to remember here. I want you guys to know this. These three are in parallel, right? Do you remember from 211 what we said about parallel? Parallel has the same voltage drop across them, right? So if these three are in parallel, the voltage drop will remain the same. So if I'm trying to um, look at this, I know when there's a positive current going through from the source here, it's going to go um, through this diode once 0 0.7 volts is achieved, and then come back to the source. And that's once it hits 0 0.7, that voltage drop is going to remain the same for all three. If we have a negative... Um, 0 0.7 volts or greater, it's all going to go through this diode here, and that voltage drop will remain the same across all three. However, if we're between the region of positive 0 0.7, so less than positive 0.7, this one won't turn on, this one's in reverse bias, so it won't turn on, then the current must go for the resistor. If we're at below negative 0.7 volts, it can't turn on this one, and it can't turn on this one since that would be in reverse bias, so all of it will have to go for the resistor. So, um, this, these two right here, clamp at 0 0.7 volts and um, negative 0 0.7 volts. So, uh, basically, if it's ever greater than 0 0.7, um, it's going to be stuck there. And if it's ever below negative 0 0.7 volts from the source, it's stuck at uh, that negative 0 0.7 volts. And then between those two values, it's going to measure the voltage across the 6K ohm resistor. So it's going to act like a voltage divider. And so this 6K ohm... How we're going to represent that with our voltage division, remember from 211, I had that fun little formula, voltage output is going to equal voltage input times the resistor you're interested in, which is the 6K, all over the 6K plus the other resistance. And that voltage output is going to be equal voltage input times, then 6,000, 6,000 divided by 6,000 plus 3,000. It's two-thirds. 
Um, so we're going to have two-thirds here as our fraction and times the voltage input. And so what's going to happen now, um, that makes sense because two-thirds should be across here and one-third across here if you don't consider these two. Uh, what's going to happen is when we're drawing our voltage output curve, looking at this, um, we're going to have to consider those two conditions. So here for my voltage output, and then we'll compare against the solutions after, but let's just think about how we would approach this. So we know until this, I'm just going to make arbitrary points on here. Let's just say this is around 0 0.7 volts. Once it reaches 0 0.7 volts, this diode will turn on. And then it's going to be maintained there. And so, um, I guess I can write that 0 0.7. But once we get to negative 0.7 volts, the other diode is going to turn on. So negative 0 0.7. So that's where this one is going to turn on. And so now that we determine where those will turn on, in between, it's going to read the voltage across the 6K ohm resistor which is going to be two-thirds of the source voltage. And so if we do two-thirds of the source voltage, um, okay, let me, just going to try and make this a little smaller. Here, that's two-thirds at that part. So that would be uh, two-thirds of whatever that value is, but then it clamps at 0 0.7 volts. In here, um, got you that, so. 0 0.7 and then it goes then it's going to show the resistor value here so in between these values is where the resistor is going to um, be turned on so in between here in between here before it clamps and then here as well this is where a resistor um, we're measuring the voltage across the resistor since it hasn't clamped yet but this one's where the one diode has clamped then we start measuring the voltage across the resistor again and then the other diode clamps at negative 0.7 volts. And then we start measuring the voltage across the resistor again. And then um, it goes on and on with the sine wave. So you can see it clamped it at 0 0.7 volts here and negative 0 0.7 volts here. And um, this will keep going with the sine wave. So if you just increase the sine wave, this is going to uh, keep going on and on where it will clamp and clamp okay and that's what it's going to look like so uh, that's what we have here and um, if we compare against what he said for this problem Oh, okay, he just assumed the voltage across the diodes was 0 0.6. I assumed they were 0 0.7, but we got the exact same solution. Okay, now that I described that one, let's do the next one I suggested, which was number five. Okay, for number five, what this is going to look like is... 6 volts root mean square, and that's a sine wave, it's going to be a 1k ohm resistor, and then we have the other Zener diode in the opposite polarity. And then whenever you write a voltage next to a Zener diode, that means that's the reverse bias breakdown voltage. So, you know, it's not the forward bias voltage. Then voltage output here. Okay. And so now that we have this, this will be our 5 volt in reverse bias, and this will be the 5 volts in reverse bias. Whenever you have Zener uh, diode, whenever you write a voltage next to it, that means that's a reverse bias um, breakdown voltage. And then here we have a 1K ohm resistor. And so it says plot the voltage and 
by the source and the voltage output. And so in order to do this, we have 6 volts RMS. And so that means our peak is 6 rad 2. And so using my ruler here, um, we're going to draw. It's going to go up to 6 red 2, and then it's going to come back down. So we're going to say this is 6 red 2, negative 6 red 2. And that's our voltage peak. Um, and now we need to determine what's the voltage going to be on the output, because we graphed the voltage from the source. So this combination here is going to clamp our circuit. And so uh, what we need to look at is, uh, just pay attention here, in the forward, if we have positive voltage being supplied, it has to overcome 5 volts of reverse bias, and remember what I told you, Zener diodes in forward bias are 0 0.7. And so it's going to have to overcome 5 plus 0 0.7, and so that would be... Um, going to be 5.7 volts it has to overcome before these diodes will turn on. Before 5.7 volts, all of it's going to be running through the 3k ohm resistor, so it's going to act as a normal voltage divider circuit, which we can represent as voltage output is equal voltage input times 3k over 3k plus 1k, which is 3 over 4 voltage input is equal to the voltage output. And then when we're in reverse vice conditions, all of it's going to go through the other way, and um, it's going to have to overcome 5 volts reverse bias and 0.7 volts forward bias. So that would be 5.7 volts total. So this, these two here are going to clamp at 5.7 volts and negative 5.7 volts. And so now that we've determined the voltage, from the source, the voltage output, what that waveform is going to look like, is, so voltage output with time, and this is our time here, so, um, we're going to have exactly um, 5.7 need to 5.7 where it's going to clamp. This goes up to 6 rad 2, which is approximately 6 rad 2. That's 8.48. So approximately 8.48 is equal to 6 rad 2. Um, and so what we're going to see is once it hits 5.7, so I'm going to estimate that about here. 5.7, 5.7, negative 5.7, negative 5.7. That sounds good with me. 5.7 here in negative 5.7 volts. And so at those points um, before that, so this is where it's going to it's going to clamp somewhere around there, somewhere around there, and down here. So it's going to clamp and then clamp. So it's never going to be able to go above that or below that since the, it's in parallel with the resistor. But before that, it's going to build up according to the resistor here because the, those diodes won't be turned on. And so it's going to act as the voltage divider. So it's going to be three-fourths of this before it gets to this point, And then it's going to be three-fourths of that voltage provided by the source. So that's what it's going to look like. And it's limited here between 5.7 volts and negative 5.7 volts due to these two being in parallel with each other. And if we check against his, oh, sorry, there you go. Um, let's see what he did, uh, 5.7, need to 5.7, yeah, okay, he did exactly the same thing where he clamped it at 5.7, need to 5.7. Okay, um, that's how I got that, and that explains his wave shaping guide, where you'll see the diodes used as protective elements, so it clamps it between certain voltage levels. 
So, um, where else will you see diodes? Now that we covered that, um, oh, what do we do with voltage output? You mean, like, what in general do we, oh. Do we just calculate it? Um, basically, voltage output in between, you don't care as much here where the resistor just takes over because it's three-fourths of the voltage input. You basically care about where the circuit's going to clamp at. It's going to clamp at 5.7 because this will be in reverse bias. This is in forward bias. And then in the other way around, this one's in reverse bias and this one would be in forward bias. So it's going to clamp between 5.7 and negative 5.7. So as long as you know that from the original curve where those occur, then uh, you just literally just connect the dots. And so um, that's how I plot it. And now we're going to go to um, our diode applications. What I talked about is going to be diode applications. So diodes can be used for protection, which is just what we saw them for. They can. That's where we see the clamping. They can be used for LEDs. And they can be used for uh, power supplies. And that's where we're going to get to next. Coming up, that's going to be a fun one. But um, a rectifier diode, whenever I refer to that, um, what that means is it's a diode used to change an AC source. to a DC source. Okay, and that's where you'll see rectifier diodes um, mostly used in, and you guys can see my screen, so let me just show you a picture of rectifier diode. Um, in a circuit. Um, here, you'll see the bridge rectifier, uh, the full wave rectifier, the half wave rectifier, um, those are the common configurations we use, because basically, um, I like visuals at least, but hopefully they help. <laughs> if you have an AC waveform, what it produces is just a constant. Um, that's your DC source. It has to go through a diode configuration, and you'll see the bridge rectifier often used. So that you, looks something like this. And just remember that... Um, when they're across from each other, they have the same polarity, so that's how I'm able to draw the bridge. Um, and then if it passes through, then it's able to produce, um, from this AC wave, a constant DC source. And so now that we talked about that, we're going to get into the three types of rectifiers. And these will be fun, you'll see them a lot, um, as you notice, but um, we'll talk about each one of them. So we have a half-wave rectifier. And the half-wave rectifier, what that is, is it's going to be our, um, best way of putting it is, I'm going to show you guys what it looks like at first. So if we have our input here of our 120 volt line, and then we have a switch here, and then we have a fuse because like for a protective circuit here. And then after the fuse, we have a primary coil. Then it's connected back here. And then we have a secondary, uh, or sorry, we have our center. We have our transformer here. Haven't taken power yet, so don't know specifically why those lines are there. But <laughs> then we have the secondary side of our transformer, and we have a diode going through it. And then we have a load. And usually we represent like the load with a load resistor or something. You'll often see that, like R bell, something like that. But uh, that's later on. We're going to talk about that power supplies. But the half wave rectifier, the big thing just to take away from it is that our waveform is going to look something like this on the input um, and for the output. Okay, so if we have 
our input is going to look like this, and then our output is just going to be until 0 0.7 volts from our input, and then it's going to turn on, and then it's going to go back off. <laughs> and so, um, just so you know, uh, that's what it looks like. So at 0 0.7 volts is where it turns on, of course, because that diode won't turn on until. But um, it basically has our normal AC wave coming in, and then it converts it only to the positive half of the AC wave, but it doesn't occur until 0 0.7 volts have just been achieved. Then our full wave rectifier, uh, so I guess best way of putting this in, I always like matching terms to what they actually mean, is because half wave, it only uses half the waveform. Whereas full wave rectifiers, There's two types, bridge and then the center top transformer. So um, this uses the full wave. The full waveform. Okay, so how we see this is, looks something like this. Full wave rectifier. And then we're going to see it has... Same exact configuration. Now I'm just going to draw the transformer because you know in the beginning, but um, primary side and then secondary side. And then we're going to have center top. This one is going to be the center top, just so you know, center top. Because in the center, you tap it to ground. Does that make sense? Center of the secondary. <laughs> um, and then we're going to have a diode here. Then we're going to have a diode here. Then it's going to go to our capacitive capacitor here. Capacitive filter, that's what we like to call it because it's used for the ripple voltage. And then we have our resistor over here. Our load resistor. And then this is connected to ground here. And what's going to happen here is I'm going to try doing the polarity. <laughs> so um, watch this real quick and then write it down if you're writing it down because you won't understand it. Okay, so here's our input and I'm going to color code it. Um, so here's the first part of the sine wave, which is positive, okay? So this is on the primary. And then what's going to happen is that positive negative, right, uh, when it comes in positively, the center tap splits it, and so it splits the polarities, and it's going to go through here to ground, and then remember, center tap is connected to ground, so that's a common terminal, and it's going to come back up here. And so, if we have then our negative end of the input, that's going to create a negative on top and a positive here. Then it's going to be positive in this section, negative due to the center top transformer. And so the current, we look at conventional current, it's going to go this direction. And then the rest is going to go for this common terminal here and downwards, back down. And so what we're going to see is that our output is going to be basically a full wave in the sense that it turns on at 0 0.7 volts here. And just keeps repeating and repeating with the input because it's sinusoidal. But it's a full wave rectifier. And then our capacitive filter here occurs, which is going to reduce the ripple voltage between each of these because it's going to take a longer time for it to go to zero. So it's going to... The capacitor filter is what causes it to 
go from the peak downwards. And that's because, if you recall, tau is going to equal, and then remember it's r times c, and so it's going to be r of l times c f, and if we have a longer time constant, because remember like in our decay, like if it's going down, if we have a longer time constant, so it takes longer to reach that value, that means that it's going to take longer for it to discharge, so therefore if we have a larger capacitor, there's going to be less ripple voltage here. And so the ripple voltage, just so you remember, V ripple, it's the difference between the minimum point and the top part of the sine wave. Okay. Now that we talked about center tap transformer, there's another one which does the full wave as well. And so um, what this looks like after, um, just so you know, because of that capacitive filter being there, it's going to look like this waveform here. because of that capacitive filter, which creates that V ripple, so now it doesn't discharge as quickly. Okay, now that we saw that, we're going to look at the bridge rectifier here. And um, just so you know, FYI, um, there will be a voltage drop, because remember this input here? It's going to have to go through one diode, so there's going to be a 0.7 volt voltage drop from the input. So just like in FYI, there is because this diode does consume a voltage, so the top of this will be the secondary voltage minus 0.7 volts, because it goes through one diode at a time. Okay, now we're going to talk about the bridge uh, rectifier, because that's the center top transformer configuration, this is the bridge configuration, and so the bridge configuration going to look like this. Oh shoot, <laughs> I drew that wrong. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Wait. Okay. Oh, good, you can see it. <laughs> okay, um... Okay, so for the bridge, it's going to be like an actual, I don't know why they call it a bridge. I guess it's like a dial bridge, but it doesn't look like a bridge to me, but whatever. Um, I think of it as like current has to go if it's positive, like in this way. So this is where the dial comes in here. And then um, the other, if it current goes through this way, then this one must resist it. And so it looks like this. And then you draw the ones opposite side in the same direction. So this one here looks like this. Then this one up here. This. And then here we're going to have it connected to ground. And then this one is going to go through a capacitive filter and the load resistor. And so this one If we have our AC waveform coming in, so I'm going to draw that over here on the left-hand side. So here's our AC waveform. And so the positive and negative, so it's going to go through here, right? And then because this diode, due to its polarity, it's going to go to the right because that one being reverse bias. It's going to come down here, go through the load resistor. And then from that, it's going to come back through here and then go to the ground, which is here. Okay. And so um, that's going to produce on our waveform, our output waveform, because we're measuring it across the load resistor. It's going to be the voltage uh, from the positive, but remember, there's two diodes it goes through now. And so... Um, you're going to have to overcome that, but what it's going to look like is, on our curve, looks like the same type of waveform. 
And then our next one is if it goes through the negative half. Uh, Wheatstone Bridge of the Shape. The name is from the Wheatstone Bridge. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that from now. 211. <laughs> Where you can determine the resistor unknown from the other resistors. Okay, uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, now we go to the bottom half where this is positive, this is negative, and therefore the current goes through this diode, goes up through here, and it's going to go through the ground back to the negative terminal because it's in the opposite direction. This is going to produce um, here our other waveform, and remember due to the capacitive filter being in the circuit, that's going to cause there to be a ripple voltage so it doesn't discharge immediately. So your end resulting waveform is going to look like this, where you just have it. So they look exactly the same at the output, right? The only difference is that this has two diodes in it. Therefore, there's uh, more of a voltage loss, where this one has only one diode that the current would be going through. So that's really, um, but the advantage of the bridge is that it doesn't require a center tap transformer. But then this one, okay, so let me just write it here. Uh, this one um, only has one diode. Diode, so there's only 0 0.7 volts power loss, where this has two diodes, so there is 1.4 volt power loss. And so, um, but this one doesn't require a center tap transformer. A center tap transformer. So that's the benefits of each. And the disadvantages. So hopefully that helps a little clarify. <laughs> and so um, now that we covered those waveforms in all the amount of ripple, that covers all the full wave configuration. So that's the end of lecture eight. Lecture nine. What are we going to see here? Oh, let me make this full screen, sorry. We'll now go to the actual. Okay. Now, getting into lecture nine a little bit, we're going to talk about a regulated power supply. And so this one is a little big. Um, I'll be back in about two minutes because I know this is a little lengthy of a topic, but a uh, two minute break real quick, okay.
Woohoo! <laughs> we're we're getting there. Uh, okay, so let's go back um, to lecture number nine, and so this is going to deal with the power supply. And oh my word, I went to this office hours so many times to understand this, so I perfected it for you guys, so you're good now. <laughs> um, so, um, what is a three-pole regulator? Basically what that is, is... It looks like this, and then there's like... We have the input to the regulator, we have the output to the regulator. And then we have a ground, the common ground. So this is the input, this is the output, and this is the common ground. Um, usually there are like 7, 8, X, X, where X, X is the voltage you want, and 8 represents positive. If you want negative voltage, you'd use a 7, 9, and then X, X, whatever voltage you want to regulate it at. And so the input to this, has lots of ripple. Where the output has little ripple. And then you're going to see that V in is going to be greater than or equal to V out plus 2 volts. And so that's, there's a 2 volt drop across this voltage regulator because it has some resistance inside of it. And if there's a resistor inside, if the current's going through, there's going to be a voltage and therefore a voltage loss is going through this. And so what we're going to look at is the three types of supplies you can have. And so the three types of supplies are a linear supply. You can have a switch supply, you can have a DC-DC converter. Okay, so now that we talked about all the different types, uh, I'm going to separate this into three columns. And so, um, a linear supply is good for low-level circuits. But it's bad for power loss. Because we have greater than 2 volts. And then the example of a linear supply is the three-pole regulator. Because two volts is pretty significant. You don't want that in your system. Uh, switch supply is bad for low-level circuits. But it's good for power. And then DC-DC converter is highly efficient for getting different power supplies. And an example of a DC-to-DC DC converter would be like a 12 volt to a 5 volt battery or requires a transformer and switches the polarity. Uh, so um, our example here I'd say is 12 volts to 5 volts. Is going from 12 volts to 5 volts, you need a transformer to step down the voltage. And um, switches the polarity. So transformer and switches the polarity. Okay. Um, now that we talked about that, we need to make a supply. And so how do we make a power supply? This is going to require a 
fair amount of steps. <laughs> uh, being honest, uh, just straight up front with you guys. So I'm going to do it on a separate sheet of paper and try to connect it all to one. So, um, let's start off with... How to make a supply. And so uh, we want constant voltage, but we also want minimal power loss. I find this one of the hardest because it requires the most amount of steps. And so um, out of everything we've done so far. But here we have our primary and then we have our secondary. And then we have our bridge rectifier. Um, wait, let me see. Can we use bridge? I think I used to actually center tap. And I think about it, center tap transformer. Yes, I use center tap transformer for this because in his calculations he used center tap. So I'm going to use the same, actually, not bridge. And so center tap, we know here, there's going to be a diode above and there's going to be a diode below. Is um, that's what we have, and then we're going to have it come up here, and it's going to go through a filter before the regulator. So this is our capacitive filter, and then it's going to have our regulator chip here, and then our regulator chip, remember, it takes an input. It has a common ground, and it has an output, and then it's connected to a load resistor, or load. And so what we have here is basically uh, we want to make a 10 volt regulated supply. So that's going to be our task. Task is make a 10 volt regulated supply. So first thing we're going to do is work backwards. So start from the load and make your way forward. So number one, work backwards from RL to transformer. Number two is you're going to select a full wave configuration. We configuration. So that was either the bridge or center top transformer. Number three is you select a regulator chip. He is how many volts are you going to get? So select a regulator chip. And so um, here we're making a 10 volt regulated supply, right? So that's where, so because it's 10 volts regulated, That's why we're going to choose a 7810 chip. And so that's where I'm going to write it in here. 7810. Because it's positive 10 volts regulated. And now we're going to determine the minimum. BC, this is where we have to determine the minimum and maximums on each side of the regulator. And so that's what I'm going to write here. Determine the minimum and max for V in and V out of regulator. So um, the voltage input minimum, the voltage output. Um, so I like to usually do voltage output min, voltage output max voltage input max and voltage input minimum. And so remember we have a two volt drop across this regulator chip. I told you guys here, across any three pole regulator you have a two volt drop you have to account for. And within these regulator chips, because it's not A type, uh, we have plus minus 4% error. For A types you have plus minus 2% error. So um, the minimum voltage output has to be 
Um, if we take minus 4% from this 10 volts, so I have my 10 volts here, 10 volts. I divide that by 100 and multiply by 96. So the minimum is 9.6 volts because that is going to account for the 4% error that can be from the 10. The maximum is going to be 10.4 um, volts, if I'm correct, 10 divided by 100 times 104. That would be the maximum, so 10.4 volts. Oh, sorry, why did I put percent sign on that? Uh, minimum is 9.6 volts, maximum is 10.4 volts. The voltage input max, there's going to be 2 volts. Okay, remember we have a 2 volt drop across this regulator chip. And so the minimum, because it can reach this value, and so if it can reach 10.4 at the output, therefore the minimum to make sure that the 2 volt voltage drop will always be accounted for. So you take the worst case scenario. So you'd have to add 2 to that. So that'd be 12.4 volts. That'd be worst case scenario. So you account for the maximum that you have to um, supply. So 12.4 minus 2 would give you 10.4. And then the voltage input minimum, uh, I'm sorry, the voltage input max is going to be um, here is where the voltage ripple is going to take place. And so I just want you guys to remember how you could choose between 10 to 20 percent or yeah, 10 to 33 percent, I think, ripple here. Your waveform is going to look something like that due to the ripple voltage, because remember voltage ripple say it's approximately 20% for what we're doing right now. So if the minimum is 12.4 that we're going to supply, the max is going to be, because this is like around 0.80% of the maximum, the maximum is going to be 12.4 volts divided by 0 0.8, which is going to give me 12.4 divided by 0.8. 15.5 when I did that calculation, 15.5 volts here. So that's my maximum input voltage to the regulator, my minimum input voltage to the regulator, then the minimum output and the maximum output. I find it easy to start from here, just calculate the output min and max, then do the input minimum, then the input maximum. And then, um, and that's what makes sense. And I'll just write this just in case here. Um, due to 2 volt loss on regulator. Okay, now that we did that, number 5. We need to determine the minimum resist load resistance. And so our minimum load resistance, because now this is where we're going to see we're working backwards. After we did all these calculations on the chip, so, determine the minimum load resistance. So, the minimum, so R of L min is going to be equal to the voltage output, right? Because it'd be, our voltage output is here, voltage output minimum divided by um, the current that would be going through. And the current for this chip specifically, it's one amp. If you have a different chip, like a 7805, I believe it's like half an amp. And so it, it depends on your chip model, but the, the chip here, it's one amp of current that goes through it. And then it is our voltage output minimum here. So um, our voltage output minimum is 9.6 volts. And so this is going to be 9.6 ohms. And so now that I gain that information, um, so let me just align these steps. So we can see the min and max for the regulator. This is dealing with it here. And then we determine the load resistor. 
So the minimum load resistance, so this is how we determine the load resistance right here. And then we go, and then after we did the load resistor and we got the regulator chip, now we're going to head off to the capacitor, right? That makes sense. So this one is determine the capacitance. And so the capacitance here, it's going to be, um, what we're going to see is, okay, the best way of putting this is because remember up here how we have 15.5 at our peak, we calculated it, and we have, um, the minimum is 12.4, the voltage is going to C, so the capacitor, um, what's going to happen is if we have to determine the effective capacitance, the effective capacitance incorporates all of this here, all this, the regulator and um, the resistance on the low resistor. And so R, because you have to do R effective first, and R effective is going to be, um, so that makes sense, what R effective when I talk about that. This whole thing here is R effective. R effective is going to be equal to, and then because remember how our capacitance, it, um, it causes it, it causes the ripple voltage. So it's going to be the average between these two divided by the current. So voltage average divided by the current that goes through the chip. And so the average between these two divided by the current, because that's like the average voltage that the capacitor is going to be dealing with. So 12.4 plus 15.5 divided by 2. Oh, let me do that. Division, addition divided by 2. It's going to be 13.95. The average voltage that that capacitor um, is going to have to deal with on the input here because um, remember this is the voltage input here so this is what the capacitor is going to see so the average voltage the capacitor sees divided by the current um, that is going to give us the current is what the regulator chip set at it's going to give us the effective capacitance so that'd be just 13.95 ohms and that makes sense because our effective should be greater than r of l and so now that we have determined, oh, sorry, that um, from our part, um, what we're going to do for the next one is, remember, we're still trying to determine the capacitance. We just determined the resistance here, but as you recall, the capacitance, um, okay, here's where I'm going to get into sort of like a tangent, but it's a good tangent. So the frequency of power, if you recall, is equal to 60 hertz, right? But since this is a full wave rectifier, that's going to be occurring. The sine wave is actually not going to be... It's going to become... The frequency, because it's a full wave, is going to be 120 hertz. Because the period's happening in less than half the time. Because it's only going to be in the positive domain, so it's going to be here. So it occurs twice as fast as before. And so then the period of a full wave, if you take the inverse of 1 over 120 hertz, that's going to give you 8.3 milliseconds. And so um, I guess you can say 8.33 if you want to be more exact. But what that means is the time for the discharge compared to the time for recharge the time for discharge is about like 80 percent we see often with our curves because going back here the time for discharge compared to the time to recharge time for discharge is um 
if you want to say, even if we made this like a linear line, it would keep going like something like, if I extended that, you know, like tried extending it, and this would reach finally like tau, we would still see that like time for discharge here would be about um, a fifth of tau. What, but um, you can, but <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that the time for discharge, it's basically going to be approximately from this entire period, it's going to be about four-fifths of that entire period here. Because as we see, this is one entire period um, from the time to discharge to the time recharge. And so that's how I like to think of it. This is one whole period here until you, the time for discharge and the time for recharge is one whole period. And so the time for discharge is about four-fifths of that whole period, and that whole period we calculated was 8.33 milliseconds. Therefore, the time for discharge from that number is going to be approximately 8.33 divided by 5 times 4, that gives us 6.66 seconds the time for discharge. And then uh, the time for recharge would be the 8.33 minus the 6.66. And now that we've done that, we've gotten uh, the time for discharge, but tau. Tau is equal to, in this part, it's going to be, um, if you drew out a linear curve since it's 20% ripple, tau is going to be, um, because one-fifth of the time for discharge is equal to tau, and so, um, or one-fifth of tau is equal to time discharge, so it's equal to five times t of d, and so this would be five times 6.66, you're going to get 33.33 milliseconds here. And so, uh, that's because if you ever look at the discharge curve here, I knew I, if I drew this out more accurately, it would be better represented, but look at this and just tell me it's about, um, it's not halfway, it's under it, but it should be about one-fifth of the entire time for the time constant tau. And so um, what you get is the time for discharge, multiply that by five, you'll get tau. And so it's about 33.33 milliseconds, and after you get that, Finally, we can determine our capacitance because the capacitance is equal to, and this is tau, because remember, tau is equal to R times C divided by the R effective resistance we just calculated. And now that we got that, we got 33.33 milliseconds divided by R effective, which we determined here was 13.95 ohms. When I do that on my calculator, 33.33 milliseconds divided by 13.95 ohms, oh, oops, I got 2.39 milli. Uh, if I want to put this in micro, I can do um, 2389 and then microfarads. Okay, so I finally determined the capacitive filter that we should use for the circuit. And now that I determined the capacitive filter, what we need to do is we finally got, okay, so we got R of L um, from here, 9.6 ohms, and then we got, so 9.6 ohms, we found the capacitor filter, which is 2389 uh, microfarads, and then we got, um, after we got the capacitor filter, now what we need to do is moving along, so I'm just going to mind this, what we see is that we need to take into account the diodes working back in the circuit. So working back in this circuit, we finally got this, 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 now we need to take into account the diodes. So the diodes are going to cause since only one of them will be used out of, well, because we have two diodes in the circuit,
you can do voltage peak plus and then the two diodes that will contribute towards it. So what we need to do here is we need to select a secondary transformer voltage. And um, when we go to select the secondary transformer voltage, the voltage secondary for the transformer is going to equal the voltage peak plus the voltage due to the diodes. And that's where we're going to put in, we just calculated our voltage peak, which was 15.5 volts here, voltage input max, 15.5 to cover for all worst case scenarios, plus the voltage by the diodes, which is 1.4 voltage drop because of these two here. And that's going to give us our voltage secondary. Um, and so now that we have gone that, we got 16.9. Hmm. Let me see. Voltage secondary equals voltage peak plus voltage diode. So this would be 16.9 volts for a secondary voltage. Yeah, okay. And now that we got that, I was like, wait, don't we have to turn that into RMS? What we do is because we got the voltage secondary here, because this is where a secondary voltage will be, we need to account in these coils there's resistance because there are coils of wire, wire has resistance. So we have to take into account about 1.1 volts, he said, due to resistance. in the coils, we do 16.9 volts plus 1.1 volt because there is some resistance there and that's going to give me 17, 18 volts. So I got 18 volts from this peak still. And remember, transformers are rated in root mean squ squared and so we have to convert this to voltage secondary root mean squared. And that's going to be equal to the voltage secondary peak that we just calculated here divided by rad 2. That's going to be 18 volt peak divided by rad 2. Hold my phone. And that'd be 18 divided by. I got 12.73 volts RMS. Okay, now that I got those. What we have to do is we're going to have to um, take into account, after we finally got our secondary voltage, is the line voltage from the primary. So now we finally, after this long work, which resolves the issue basically with the diodes, we got there, we accounted for them, then we took into account the coils, and we converted to that root mean squared value. Now we got to do the next step, which is take into account the primary coil. Very clean. And so this is where the line voltage it average is 115 volts here, but the minimum that it can get to is 110 volts RMS. And so we have to account for that. So our voltage secondary has to account for worst case scenarios RMS. It's going to be equal to the 115 divided by the 110. So um, the normal line voltage divided by the worst case scenario line voltage multiplied by the voltage we had it set at 12.73 volts RMS, going to equal 13.31 volts root mean squared. 13.31 volts root mean squared. Okay. Now that we have taken that into account, the primary coil, from our diagram. What we can do is, the last thing is we need to use 
uh, because we're using a center top transformer. So, last thing is because a center top transformer, you have to multiply it by 2. So, due to the center top transformer here, using center top transformer. It's going to be our voltage secondary full is equal to our 13, I mean 3, 1 volts root mean square times 2, which is going to be 26.61 volt root mean squared. And because of this, we need to select. A transformer with voltage secondary, so select. This is greater than 27 volts RMS. Okay. Now that we have covered that, our diagram here, the last thing we need to fill in is 27 volts root mean squared. So that's the main parts of how to make a power supply. Um, Basically, if we're in charge of making a 10 volt regulated supply, work backwards from the back to the front. You select a full wave configuration because that's how you get the most out of your money. Here we use the center top transformer. I suggest you do the same. Select a regulator chip. You have the 7810 um, because that's 10 volts regulated. Positive 10 volts is 8. And then we need to turn the min uh, input and output voltage. So first look at the output voltage. Then look at the input if you're working backwards. So um, the output minimum is going to have to be um, not uh, 10 volts, and then remember it's within 10% of that. And so we, I mean within 4%. So the lowest it can get is 9.6 volts. The maximum it can get is 10 plus 4%, and so that's 10.4 volts. And then the maximum has to, uh, sorry, the minimum has to take into account the max on the output because there's a two volt voltage drop so it cover all the scenarios in the output voltage so this would be 12.4 volts and then the input maximum due to the 20 percent ripple we take that into account and it's 15.5 volts then we need to determine the load resistance load resistance is going to be voltage output um, minimum divided by the current that the chips rated at which is one amp and so that's what we got 9.6 ohms then we have to determine the capacitor the capacitor is determined by the voltage um, at the input uh, we have to do um, the voltage at the input divided by the current going for the chip so the average voltage running in divided by the current will give us r effective here because r effective we have to multiply that um, by um, what we're going to do later on um, you'll see but we finally find the period which is 8.33 milliseconds and then we get the time for discharge and then once we get tau then that's where we divide it by our effective in order to solve for the capacitance value once we get our capacitance value we have to select a secondary um, transformer voltage and so we have to take into account now the diodes and then the uh, due to the resistance in the coils and then because the line volt voltage can fluctuate between 110 to 120 volts that's where we account for worst case scenario here it's an average is 115 but divide by worst case and then we use the center tap transformer so you have to multiply that voltage by two okay now that's the general thing of how to make a power supply and it involves a lot of steps like i told you guys i don't know if he's going to test us on all these steps or he's going to have us just look at his um i can't really say i don't know but at least you're familiar with it. I would say, like, this is low priority. I can't, I don't know what he wrote as. But um, the next one, um, that covers basically everything that has been, that will be tested on. And because everything else is about transistors that I've taken notes on. And so that is... Um, everything that we will cover so i'll pause uh, i'll stop the recording and then